Okay, uh, so welcome to the morning session. Um, so the first talk of the session is uh, um, can optimally, uh, optimally fair coin tossing be based on one way functions is by Dana Duckman Solid, uh, Mohammed Mahmoudi, and Tal Martin. Okay, so um, as Evgeny said, this talk is titled Can Optimally Fair Coin Tossing Be Based on One Way Function? Um, and it's joint work with Mohammed Mahmoudi and Tal Malkin. So in a two-party coin tossing protocol, we have our parties Alice and Bob, um, and they're going to run a protocol, and at the end, each is going to output a single bit. And the properties of the coin tossing protocol are that the output of an honest party uh, is going to be 0 or 1, with probability 1 half. And the second property says that if both parties honestly follow the protocol, then they are guaranteed to output the same bit. Okay, and coin tossing is a fundamental cryptographic primitive, um, and in particular, it's a basic building block for two-party computation protocols. So let's take a look at a classic example of a coin tossing protocol called Blum's coin tossing over the telephone. So we have our two parties, Alice and Bob, and in the first message, Alice will send a commitment to her coin, coin A. Then Bob will send his coin back to Alice. And in the last message, Alice will open her commitment to reveal coin A. And the output of both parties is going to be the XOR of coin A and coin B. OK, so very simple protocol. What can we say about the security of Blum's coin toss? So it turns out that if the execution completes, then the coin toss will be secure. And intuitively, this is because Alice cannot impose bias on the outcome due to the binding property of the commitment scheme, whereas Bob cannot impose bias on the outcome due to the hiding property of the commitment scheme. But now, what happens if we require that Bob still output some value, even in the case that Alice aborts early, before sending her last message. Well, in this case, it actually turns out that Blum's protocol is no longer secure, and Alice can actually impose substantial bias on Bob's outcome by deciding whether or not to send uh, the last message, depending on whether it's favorable for her or not. And this type of adversarial Alice that we see here who acts honestly and only deviates from the protocol by deciding whether or not to abort early is known as a fail-stop adversary. And this is the type of adversary that we're going to be considering uh, for the rest of the talk. Okay, and one thing to note is that Blum's coin tossing protocol is actually a black box protocol from one-way functions. So what is known in the case where one of the parties may abort early? So Cleave showed that if we repeat Blum's protocol uh, many times um, and take the majority over all executions, then we can actually improve the security and achieve bias of 1 over squared of r in r rounds. And all this is, again, uh, constructions assuming only one-way function. On the other hand, Cleave also proved a lower bound, which tells us that for any coin tossing protocol, there is always an efficient strategy for either Alice or Bob to impose bias of at least 1 over r in r rounds. And so given this lower bound, uh, we define optimally fair coin tossing to be coin tossing which achieves this optimal bias of 1 over r in r rounds. Um, subsequently, Cleveland and Pagliazzo showed that in the information theoretic setting, um, a fail-stop adversary can always bias the outcome by 1 over square root of r. However, until recently, it was not known whether it was actually possible to achieve the optimal bias of 1 over r in the computational setting. And recently, um, Moran et al., uh, very surprisingly, constructed a protocol that actually achieves this optimal uh, 1 over r bias. However, this protocol of Moran et al. Um, actually uses generic multi-party computation techniques. 
And so it relies on stronger assumptions than one-way function. And in particular, they're going to require oblivious transfer, or OT, for their protocol. So given this state of affairs, there are a couple of uh, natural open questions that we can ask. So first, can we actually achieve optimal bias of 1 over R in R rounds, assuming only the existence of one-way function? Or on the flip side, are stronger assumptions actually necessary to achieve the optimal bias of 1 over R? And in this work, we're going to consider an important special case. And we're going to ask whether there is a black box construction of optimally fair coin tossing from one-way function. OK, so what is known in the black box setting? So here, uh, in a previous work, we ruled out constructions of optimally fair coin tossing from one-way function, but only when the number of rounds in the coin tossing protocol is small. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that a little later. And uh, in this work, we fully resolve the question for any number of rounds, uh, but only for a natural variant of black box constructions that we believe may be of independent interest. So let's look more closely at the types of protocols that we consider in this work. So first, we consider only fully black box reductions. So we consider constructions of uh, coin tossing from one-way functions that are black box constructions. And we also require that the security proof be black box. And additionally, we introduce a new property, which we call function obliviousness. And we say that a coin tossing protocol is function oblivious if the honest outcome of the coin toss, C, depends only on the random coins of the two parties, Alice and Bob, but does not depend on the specific implementation of the one-way function f. Um, and we note that various known coin tossing protocols actually possess this additional property. And additionally, although we consider this uh, in, the, uh, in the setting of coin tossing, um, this is a general class of protocols um, which we believe is natural and does not seem to have been previously considered in the literature. And we believe that um, this class of protocols may actually be interesting in other settings. So the main result of this work is that we show that there is no black box construction of function oblivious and optimally fair coin tossing from one-way function. And so let's compare these results to the previous work. So in our previous work, we showed that any black box construction of optimally fair coin tossing <coughs> from one-way function will require at least n over log n rounds, where n is the input-output length of the one-way function. And so it turns out that these two results are actually um, incomparable. And the reason is that in this work, we do not place a restriction on the number of rounds in the protocol, but we only rule out a subclass of protocols, which are these function oblivious protocols. Um, in our previous work, we did place a restriction on the number of rounds in the protocol, but we managed to rule out any black box construction. OK, so let's look a little bit at some intuition and uh, the techniques that we used um, to get our result. And um, this is just a list of some of the tools that we used in order to prove our theorem. And I'll be talking uh, more about each one of these um, in a little bit more detail. OK, so um, the setting of our lower bound is the random oracle model. And so here, we assume that we have two parties, Alice and Bob, who are running an R round coin tossing protocol. And in addition, they both have access to uh, the random oracle F. And intuitively, the random oracle models an idealized one-way function that Alice and Bob have access to. And so note that in the random oracle model, there is actually a very trivial construction of coin tossing from one-way function. Uh, 
from in the random oracle model. And basically, uh, the parties will just both query the random oracle on a predetermined input and simply output that value as the output of the coin toss. Okay. However, um, you know this protocol is clearly a cheat. There is nothing very interesting going on here. And fortunately for us, we won't have to worry about this type of cheat in our uh, result because this type of protocol is clearly not a function oblivious protocol. So the output of the parties depends on the specific instantiation of the random oracle. However, uh, this example should give us a little bit more intuition for what uh, the function intuitively what the function obliviousness property uh, does. So intuitively, this property is trying to uh, impose the fact that the random oracle should only be used for the security uh, of the coin toss, but you should not be using the random oracle in order to get the correctness property of the coin toss. And since we're in the random oracle model, it turns out that in order to uh, prove our lower bound, it's going to be sufficient to present a computationally unbounded strategy for either Alice or Bob, which makes a total polynomial number of oracle queries and allows either Alice or Bob to impose a bias greater than 1 over r on the outcome of the coin toss. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a result by Cleveman and Pagliazzo, which shows that in the information theoretic setting, uh, there is always a strategy for either Alice or Bob to abort early and impose bias of 1 over square root of r on the outcome. So let's try to see what happens when we try to apply the uh, CI result naively to our setting. And let's try to see where this actually goes wrong. So in the CI result, um, they're going to be considering uh, these, two va these values um, at each round. Um, and so this is the expected value of C, which is the outcome of the coin toss, conditioned on the current partial transcript, trans I. Okay, so after each message, uh, the parties will be computing uh, these values. And note that it's important for us that these expectations are taken over choice of random oracle. And we're actually not computing these expectations relative to some uh, fixed oracle. And what the CI result shows is that with high probability, there will be some round i where these expected values are far. In particular, they're going to be 1 over square root of r far from each other. And in addition, uh, the CI result also considers an additional value, CI plus 1. And CI plus 1, this is the value that is output by Bob in the case that Alice aborts early before sending the I plus first message. Okay, and what the CI result does is they show a strategy uh, for either Alice or Bob uh, to impose bias on the outcome. And uh, the proof that this strategy uh, is effective is going to rely both on the fact that there is a gap between these expected values, but it's also going to critically rely on the fact that the expected value of CI plus 1 conditioned on the i partial transcript is equal to the expected value of CI plus 1 conditioned on the I plus first uh, partial transcript. OK, however, this turns out to be a problem for us uh, in the random oracle model. And it turns out that in the random oracle model, uh, it may in fact be the case that these expected values are not equal. Um, and even worse, it turns out that uh, you know, these, these values, the expected value of uh, Bob's outcome when Alice aborts early, conditioned on uh, the i transcript and the i plus first transcript, these can actually be 1 over square root of r far from each other. And 
And intuitively, the reason for this is that the random oracle is going to create dependencies uh, between the view of Alice and the view of Bob. And in particular, what could happen is that when Alice queries the random oracle in order to um, compute the I plus first message, this may actually reveal additional information about Bob's private view. Okay. And so um, most of our result is going, uh, most of the technical part of our result is about how to kind of get around uh, this problem. And in order to do this, uh, we're going to consider uh, this additional quantity, which we call MV, or middle value. And intuitively, what this thing is, is um, we can consider the, the inner part. So this is the expected value of the outcome of the coin toss, conditioned on a particular view of B. And then we can actually take the expectation of this value, where views of B are uh, sampled condition on the I plus first partial transcript. And so in our analysis, we're going to be considering a whole bunch of cases. Uh, and in each case, if this case occurs, we have to uh, present a strategy for Alice or Bob to leverage uh, the fact that this case occurs in order to succeed in imposing bias on the outcome. And it turns out that in our analysis, uh, the hard case for us is going to be the case where um, these two values are far apart. So the expected value of Bob's output conditioned on the I plus first transcript um, and this middle value that we consider. OK, and so our goal is to present a strategy where if these two quantities are far apart, then Alice is going to be able to impose bias on the outcome. And it turns out that by the CI result, um, Alice can actually impose bias if the expected value of the outcome conditioned on the I plus first transcript and the expected value of Bob's output if Alice aborts conditioned on the I plus first transcript are far from each other. And so our idea is going to be um, to try to set things up so that um, the expected value of the outcome condition on the I plus first transcript and this middle value are close to each other. Okay, so let's take um, a little bit of a closer look at these two quantities and what's going on here. So um, basically, intuitively, the difference uh, between these two quantities is that when we sample uh, the view of B conditioned on the I plus first transcript, so we sample it conditioned on the I plus first transcript, uh, but the view itself does not contain the I plus first transcript. It only contains the I partial transcript. Okay, so somehow when you're computing this inner expected value, you have less information in the second case. And uh, our intuition is going to be that these quantities will be far apart if the I plus first transcript contains a lot of information about uh, A's view beyond what is already contained in the I transcript. Um, and our intuition is that uh, we can actually show that these two quantities are close uh, if the following two conditions are true. First, the outcome of the coin toss should depend only on the two views, view the ith view of B and the i plus first view of A, which in particular uh, include the random coins of A and B. And second, if the i plus first transcript does not reveal information about A's view beyond what is already uh, revealed by the ith transcript. Okay, and so our first condition, this is where the function obliviousness property is going to come in. It's going to guarantee that the first condition is true. Um, and I'm going to talk very briefly about how we can try to, how we achieve uh, this uh, second property. So the idea is that we're going to simulate a fake I plus first message, which is distributed like a real message, 
but does not leak information about A's view. And intuitively, what we'd like to do in order to achieve this is we want to just sample a view, view prime for A, conditioned on the current transcript, current i transcript, and then compute the next message honestly based on this uh, fake view. So this would be great if we could do it, uh, but the problem is that uh, the distribution here may not be correct. And in particular, uh, the i plus first message computed in this way may not look right to Bob. And it won't look right to Bob in the case that Bob has already made a query that appears in this fake view, view prime, but he has received a different response from the real oracle. However, we shouldn't be uh, too worried about this because um, this may remind you of the problem of finding intersection queries uh, between the parties Alice and Bob. Um, and it turns out that uh, the results of Mpaliazo Rudish and Brak Mahmoudi are going to help us in order to rule out, uh, in order to prevent uh, this situation. And so intuitively, we're going to be considering augmented transcripts, where in addition to sending uh, their message, I, each party will also run the Eve algorithm of Barak and Mahmoudi alongside the protocol. And the queries made by Eve are going to be appended uh, to each message of the protocol. And intuitively, this is not going to affect the security of the protocol because at each point, both parties, Alice and Bob, can both uh, run this Eve algorithm and they can both uh, come up with this set of queries given only the common transcript. OK, and so now that uh, we've presented intersection queries uh, between Alice and Bob, we've solved uh, the first problem of inconsistency between these views. But now our simulation is going to end up being more complicated uh, since the simulated transcript, uh, the ith message, the i plus first message is now going to contain, in addition, these uh, simulated uh, Eve queries as well. So we have to figure out how can we uh, simulate these Eve queries uh, in the right way. And the idea is going to be that we don't want to change uh, too many responses of the Eve queries. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run the Eve algorithm honestly uh, on the fake transcript. And we're going to uh, decide uh, when to answer oracle queries made by Eve honestly. And at some points, we're going to switch a few of the responses of uh, the random oracle. And intuitively, the cases when we switch responses are, um, of course, first, when a query made by Eve is a query that is inside this fake view, view prime. And then we respond uh, consistently with the fake view. But additionally, we also have to switch another set of queries. And these are queries made by Eve that fall inside the original view, uh, but not in the fake view. And intuitively, we're going to switch responses to these queries to random. OK, so um, given our result, there are still uh, some remaining open questions. So in particular, can we actually remove this extra requirement of function oblivious uh, protocols? Or on the flip side, um, can we actually find a non-function oblivious protocol which uh, achieves optimally fair uh, coin tossing from one-way function? And additionally, um, can this uh, newly formalized notion of function obliviousness uh, be useful in some other setting?